Korea, hope spread with the armistice. The Korean War never officially ended, and now a dictator with nukes and long-range missiles could strike the United States. There really probably are no good military options for the United States. We'll take you through the history, the crisis today, and where we go from here. It is a direct threat to the United States. We are at grave risk as a nation. Meanwhile, we still have a raging debate over health care, and we'll show you how families across Tampa Bay say they're getting burned. It put me in the poorhouse and ruined my credit. We'll also map out changes in the race for Florida governor and go one-on-one -on -one with House Speaker Richard Corcoran, who may join the race. But we'll start with a closer look at the president's controversial moves and how they relate to points in his book. This is Money, Power, and Politics. To all the pundits who claim the president is impulsive, his book suggests he may be far more calculating than they think. The president considers himself a strategist, and by definition, a strategist is consistently inconsistent. And Trump believes controversy and exaggeration can work to his advantage, based on what he has written in his book. Here are three examples. Number one, what was President Trump thinking with a tweet? Now, the president took a lot of heat for tweeting this video of him pretending to beat up a man with a CNN logo on his face. But consider the possibility that he wanted to take heat after a rough couple of weeks on the health care debate. So he pulled focus from that by goading pundits into attacking him. He is going to get somebody killed in the media. Maybe that will stop him. Then he pulled more focus by attacking them. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them. So for at least a couple of days, he changed the narrative from the fact that his health care plan stalled to Trump versus the media, which plays to his base. That's taken from a line in his book, The Art of the Deal. He wrote, bad publicity is sometimes better than no publicity at all. Controversy, in short, sells. Number two, what was Trump thinking when he called the same health care plan both great and mean? He appeared to contradict himself when he gushed about how great the House health care plan was, and then he called it mean. What we have is something very, very incredibly well-crafted. Mean, that was my term. This is a great plan, but very importantly, it's a great plan. Well, in short, the president may have exaggerated his initial support for the plan, then later said it was mean when it came time for revisions. And this plays to another key point from his book. He wrote, quote, the final key to the way I promote is bravado. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and most spectacular. I, the president here, calls it truthful hyperbole. And that puts a lot of his controversial remarks in perspective. I know more about ISIS than th the generals do, believe me where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? And number three, what was Trump thinking when he downplayed the deal? He repeatedly said we have to replace Obamacare, that we have no choice. Then after the plan stalled in the Senate, he said it would be okay if they don't strike a deal. This will be great if we get it done. And if we don't get it done, it's just gonna be something that we're not gonna like and that's okay. Well, that appears to be taken from another line in his book. Quote, the worst thing you can possibly do in a deal is seem desperate to make it. That makes the other guy smell blood and then you're dead. If we don't get it done, it's just going to be something that we're not going to like and that's OK. On that point, Republicans and Democrats have very different approaches to health care reform. But both sides do agree there should be reform because prices are going up for people who buy health insurance through the government exchange and choices are going down. And a lot of people here in Florida are having nightmares over their coverage. That's the focus of tonight's We the People. Yeah. We met Janice Dubbin back in February when hundreds of Florida Blue customers filed complaints. This was an absolute fight. It was a nightmare. She had hit her head and spent days in the hospital. And then she found out her health insurance 
had been canceled. How much did those bills add up to when they said... $40,000. She fought to get reinstated, while others like Mark Lepresti later got slammed by a billing glitch. I received a low account balance alert from my bank. Back in May, they ran his payment, then mistakenly ran it again more than 70 times. It was thousands and thousands of dollars overdrawn, tens of thousands. Overdrawn. Florida Blue apologized, said it would refund overpayments and reimburse for any overdrawn bank accounts. But Todd Bakefield said he still got burned. It put me in the poorhouse and ruined my credit. The Affordable Care Act cost him more than he ever imagined. The first time I went to the hospital, I passed out from the pain. He had a massive kidney stone, and the hospital would not accept his insurance, so he got swamped in bills. So I'm actually still in debt to them for over $10,000. Then he struggled to find a doctor who would take his insurance. The list of doctors they sent to treat me, it took seven tries before I found a doctor that would accept my insurance. So he finally found one, but then he got a job with health benefits, so he tried to cancel the policy he bought off the exchange. So I actually called Florida Blue first. They told me I could not cancel through them because I had to call the marketplace. So I called the marketplace and they said, yes, you canceled through us. Then weeks after healthcare.gov supposedly canceled his policy, they took more than $400 out of his account, which made him rack up hundreds more in bounce check fees. I called Florida Blue and they told me they didn't receive any cancellation notice that I needed to call the marketplace. And guess what happened when he said he called the marketplace? Marketplace told me it wasn't their fault that I needed, since the money was already taken out, that they needed to call, that I needed to call Florida Blue. So I called Florida Blue back. Again, Florida Blue said I needed to call the Marketplace. He said the Marketplace and Florida Blue finally agreed he had canceled the policy, but it did not take because of a glitch. So they reimbursed him for the payment, but not the bounce check fees. And she said, sir, all I could do is say I'm sorry, it was a glitch in our system. Florida Blue got flooded with new customers because other insurers bailed out of the exchange. And the politicians may want to listen to a man like Todd Bakefield to get why a lot of people don't trust them on health care. The worst part is, when I went to work for where I work now, and they offered the insurance, it was through the marketplace. Wanted to stand up, but I didn't want to embarrass myself at orientation and just tell them, don't do it. Don't do it. Well, a Florida Blue spokeswoman said the company has been working with customers one by one to refund overpayments and any bank fees they may have incurred. And Todd Bakefield told us that he later was reimbursed for overdraft fees after we asked Florida Blue to look into his problems. Please check out our YouTube channel for our long form investigations of health care. We have a breakdown of the problems and potential solutions. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power and Politics and click subscribe at the top of the page. You'll also find extended interviews on the health care debate, tax reform and national security, which brings us to North Korea. This agreement is good for the United States. That was former President Clinton when he thought he had struck a deal with North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program in exchange for fuel. North Korea cheated on that agreement. After six party talks, the Bush administration thought it had convinced North Korea to dismantle its nuclear program, again in exchange for aid. We're going to get out of the business of producing nuclear weapons. But instead, North Korea accelerated its nuclear program, and now it has a missile that could reach Alaska. The threat is much more immediate now, and so, so it, it's clear that we can't repeat the same approach, failed approach of the past. Rather than pressing our uh, our strategy to the point of some kind of miscalculation on the part of the North Koreans or others, for that matter. The important thing would be to keep the pressure on the Chinese to try to see if we can't get North Korea to the negotiating table. Well, China says that's what it's doing, that it is pressuring North Korea. And the Trump administration says that's all just a bunch of talk. Remember, China is North Korea's ally in this. And the missiles are pointed at China's rivals. So to a certain extent, China may think that a divided Korea works to its advantage because if North Korea collapses, there would be a flood of refugees into China and Korea may well reunite and become a competing power in China's own backyard. This is complicated. And that brings us once more to North Korea's test of a long range missile, which President Trump once said 
would not happen. The whole world has to come together to get them to stop and denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. This is a crisis more than 60 years in the making. First, Japan conquered Korea. Then, after World War II, the Allies conquered Japan. Stalin and Truman took Korea and divided it along the 38th parallel. The Communist Soviets shaped the North. The United States influenced and shaped the South. Then the North invaded the South. The war turned into a stalemate but never officially ended. And now North Korea's dictator may try to end it with a nuclear flash. We've gotten into this I dare you situation. I dare you to appear weak. And that's what's scary to our allies as well as to a lot of Americans, especially those on the West, on the West Coast and in Alaska and Hawaii. And that's why the president is pressing China to step up pressure. That's North Korea's biggest trading partner and the nation with the most leverage over North Korea. And the administration says it needs to do more than just fret about the tensions. If tension uh, only goes up and goes up only, then sooner or later it will get out of control and the consequences would be disastrous. And this is also tricky because threats and pressure drive what? Drive attention. And Kim Jong-un thrives on attention. And the more he escalates, the more attention he gets. And coming up, we have some changes and controversy in the race for Florida governor. And State President House Speaker State Richard Corcoran could also shake things up. Joining the race himself, we'll go one on one with Speaker Corcoran. You said you made a mistake. Was it technically a violation of law to send no, out a fundraising email? Not. Of course not. Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum got an early jump on the Democratic yeah, race for governor, but he has been dogged by controversy, first for sending political messages through his official office email. I get the fact that the Republicans are going to make as much hay uh, over this as they can. It's Was it exactly, a mistake? Was it a mistake? Oh, absolutely, which we recognize. And now he's dealing with an FBI investigation of development deals within his city. Though Gillum says he's not the target, it weighs on his bid for governor. And it appears to give former Congresswoman Gwen Graham the inside track in the Democratic race. She's running on ending high-stakes testing in schools and reviving high-speed rail in Tampa Bay that Governor Scott blocked for years. He said that it would have been an albatross to taxpayers. Did he get that right or wrong? He got that wrong. Uh, we need mass transit in the state of Florida. Meanwhile, in the Republican race for governor, Commissioner of Agriculture Adam Putnam is the early favorite. He's running on a conservative agenda on the economy, gun rights, and health care. And if that involved taking away protections for people with pre-existing conditions, are you open to that or not open to it? We, we should protect the pre-existing condition component of that. But Putnam could pick up some well-known competition in the Republican race from Senate Appropriations Chairman Jack Latvala and Republican House Speaker Richard Corcoran. Corcoran drove some big changes in Tallahassee this year from education reform to more oversight at the state's marketing arm, Visit Florida. Okay, House Speaker Richard Corcoran, you've become a bit of a regular on our show and I'm grateful for it. Let's start with a tweet from Jack Latvala. While Richard Corcoran mingled with Koch Brothers donors in Colorado, I was happy to be with the VFW members and dentist. Okay, when's the last time you've mingled with a dentist? <laughs> uh, uh, I just had to reschedule my latest dental appointment, so I... I he, well, he's doing what I think the kids call these days, what is it, throwing shade? Yeah. I, I, listen, I think what's at, what's at work, uh, Craig, is um, we have gone out and we have said this is philosophically what we believe is best for the people of the state. These are the policies that will emanate from that philosophy and this is how the people benefit. We're saying we're going to change kids' lives in education. We're going to give property owners uh, tax relief. We're going to do all these things and we did. I don't worry about the critics. We'll just keep doing what we know is beneficial for the people of the state. Those critics you don't worry about also came after you when you said that state lawmakers have the best interest of people in mind more than local officials. And to that point, Senator Latvala said that was one of the most ridiculous things that had ever come out of your mouth. I'm starting to get the feeling he doesn't like you. But you know what? I'm also getting the feeling that he might be running for governor. And I'm getting the feeling that you might be running for governor. What are the prospects? 
Well, I'll address the issue first. You know, people rephrase it. What we said was that the founding fathers said that government works best for the people, and that's what we're in the business of helping people. It works best when local government, state government, federal government, uh, the judicial branch, the legislative branch, the executive branch stay in their constitutionally authorized lanes. And when you have one of those groups going encroaching on the other side, it doesn't work. And so, what my point is is local governments trying to tell the people of the state that. Uber should be uh, outlawed and we shouldn't be able to use it. They're taking away their Second Amendment constitutional rights to carry guns. They're taxing them every single year over and over. They're paying with taxpayer money lobbyists to come to Tallahassee to tell Tallahassee not to give their own people a property tax cut. And so my point is, when local governments engage in that kind of behavior, not only are they outside their constitutional lane, but they've lost touch with the people. That's completely out of touch with what the people want. Um, as far as uh, as far as we're running for governor, as far as running for governor, uh, I say the same thing. I, you know, we've done a lot of great things um, in the first year, and we have another year of being speaker, and we're going to keep fighting for those things that we weren't able to succeed. So, to the extent that you run for a higher office, or we push those citizen initiatives and get the people to uh, help us put it on the ballot so that we can make those positive changes, all of those are on the table. And and, and my timeline, I tell everyone, you know, we're going to raise the money now and. And March, hopefully, I'm done being speaker, which is one of the greatest honors um, I could ask for from the people of the state. And and then we'll make a decision on wh what's the best path forward to make a difference for the people. No decision from you until March of next year or That's thereafter. Yeah, yeah. Politics makes strange bedfellows, right? Always. Explain to me how John Morgan may also be running for governor. He's making a lot of noise as well, and yeah. is threatening to sue well. you, sue the legislature over the medical marijuana amendment rules. And yet, he is raising money for your PAC. How does that work? I think that, um, that your, your, your phrase is a good one, but I, John Morgan, I've known John Morgan for a long time, whether it's working on trying to implement the will of the people. 71% of the people wanted medical marijuana, they wanted it medicinally, and they wanted access to it. We fought for that in the House and ultimately got the Senate to come along and, and implement the will of the people. And I think all those things, listen, I, I say it all the time, if you, if you there is a truth. It's objective, it's knowable, and if you go out there and you fight for truth that you know helps people, um, those kinds of situations happen where you can have strange bedfellows because at the end of the day they're always going to respect that you're fighting for what you believe in and you believe that those things are what's best for the state um, and, and you're courageous enough to go out there and fight for them. Good things happen and people rally around that, I think. That's, that's uh, the best I got. You're concerned about wasted Visit Florida in Enterprise Florida. Those agencies are still getting much more money than you originally wanted, but there is more oversight. Is it enough? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you that there will still be waste within those agencies? That there will be waste? I'd say I'm down to about a, a 3 or a, a 2 or a 3. And here's why. One, we didn't fund Enterprise Florida. What we did is we um, said no more picking winners and losers, no more corporate welfare. With Visit Florida, what we did is we said no longer. You remember we talked about the contract with Pitbull, the contract with a soccer team, the contract with a race car, a fishing show, Emerald, all these contracts. Every single one of those contracts that they entered into that we criticized now has to come back to the legislature for consultation for 14 days and either the Speaker, the, the Appropriation Chairman in the House, or the President and the Appropriation Chairman in the Senate any one of those four people objects and says that contract's not valid, they, it's nullified and they can't enter, enter into it. That's going to clean up all of that, that uh, literally cesspool of contracts that did nothing for the taxpayers or tourism. House Speaker Corcoran, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, more controversy over Florida's Stand Your Ground law. The governor changed the law. Then a judge ruled the change is unconstitutional. We'll show you where this one is leading and what it means. That choice that I made that day, I wouldn't change it. It was the best I could do. Okay, Marissa down. Alexander is a mother from Jacksonville who inspired lawmakers to change her stand your ground law. She said her estranged husband beat her when she was pregnant. He headbutted me. I remember my shirt being ripped. He threw me over a, um, a bed. Threw you over a bed? Yeah, yeah. When you were pregnant? Mm-hmm. She got a restraining order, and then nine days after she gave birth to their little girl, her husband showed up, and she claims he threatened to kill her. So she took the gun she legally owned and claims she fired a warning shot to scare him away. And that's how she got a 20-year sentence, then a retrial in which prosecutors demanded more. 60. Big pardon? 60 years. 60 years? Yeah. So she took a plea deal got released, and then lobbied lawmakers to make it easier to claim self-defense. 
and the NRA joined her call for change. Anytime the state charges you with a crime, they have the burden of proof, all the way from arrest to the jury room. The legislature and governor responded by changing the law, in effect making it easier for shooters to avoid trial. Instead of the shooters having to prove they were in fear for their lives, prosecutors have to prove they were not. But a South Florida judge just ruled the changes unconstitutional. Judge Milton Hirsch ruled the legislature overstepped its power and that only the state Supreme Court has authority to make such changes. Well, that drew strong pushback from lawmakers. For example, Representative Jason Brodeur tweeted, so judges should make laws. This whole time, I've been confused. Well, critics say the changes with this law make it easier for defendants to get away with murder. Then you have supporters like lawmakers who passed this, including House Speaker Corcoran, who joined us just a couple of minutes ago, who says he expects the courts to uphold this on appeal. OK, coming up, we'll show you what to expect after the president's meeting with Vladimir Putin. Well, you can make the case that as they met, Vladimir Putin had the upper hand because he has far more experience in the world stage and with intelligence. Or you can make the case that President Trump may have had the upper hand because he uh, is a bit more unpredictable. Well, we have someone who knows Vladimir Putin very well, his former travel partner who lives in Tampa Bay. You'll hear his perspective on our YouTube channel, Craig Patrick's Money, Power and Politics. Folks, that's our show. We'll see you next week.